GM friends, and welcome to the Metacast Crypto Corner brought to you by Navic. I'm your host, Nico Vreke, and today I'm joined by Andrew Green, who is a co founder and the CEO, CEO at Strider or Strider DAO. Strider is a Web3 platform that helps harness the creative, creative power of communities to build new game and entertainment IP. And there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot of questions I have when I read sentences like that. Um, so yeah, let's dive in. First of all, Andrew, welcome and thank you for joining me here. Thanks so much, Nika. It's great. Could you, um, let, let's start a bit about you because you have a long history in the games industry. And so um, I think that experience leads a bit into what you're building. So I guess a bit of background would be good. Yeah, so um, I've been in games for uh, 22 years now, uh, but I'm not as old as I seem because I started when I was actually 20. Um, and um, I, um, you know, was was kind of on forums and, and you know, look at doing, basically just participating in, in the initial digital communities uh, for games online. And Take-Two Interactive had a job that I saw for, um, you know, like a community lead and a product person, product manager, but back then it was package goods. So like, it's very different. Uh, and I was just like, I want that job. And I never went to college by the way. Um, so uh, I um, called the CEO uh, of Take-Two Interactive and I ranted on his voicemail uh, and sounded like an insane person. And apparently the voicemail was so crazy that he sent it around to a bunch of people and they were all like laughing about it, but they were like, you know, he's apparently very excited. Uh, so they had me in for an interview and I got the job and that got me started in, uh, in games, both in like really early, like internet and digital marketing and, um, what, what we referred to as, as product management or, or brand management, like for console package goods back in 2000. Um, I, I worked at Take Two Interactive and then Atari. I uh, worked on a cool game there called The Matrix Path of Neo. Um, and then I went to Electronic Arts, where I was more focused on uh, community and digital um, initially. And, um, you know, it was direct. Like, for instance, we were like the community managers for Battlefield and then Skate and, um, and then, um, you know, a bunch of other uh, products. But eventually, because Dead Space was such a ground up type of, new IP for EA, um, me and, and my, my friend, good friend, uh, but, but colleague Ben Swanson, who now runs, uh, influencers at Ubisoft. Um, we, um, they tapped us to kind of like help co-lead, uh, Dead Space, um, and really build that brand from the ground up because it's, it, it had to be community led. Um, and, you know, we worked with the incredible team and, and launched the Dead Space franchise. And then Dead Space 2. And, you know, it's, it's an extraordinarily beloved fan drip, fan first franchise, uh, that's actually getting a remaster now. I'll speed things up a little. Uh, I went to, uh, I, I, I went into free to play product management at EA, then to a Facebook canvas games company called Law Labs, and eventually ended up at Tiny Co., which was one of the first ever free to play mobile games companies in the world. I helped run the operations of Tiny Co. and partnered very closely with the CEO. Um, I did product strategy and green light. Um, built teams, um, and, um, you know, the portfolio we, we created generated like, I think 1.3 billion in gross revenue, which is like really awesome. And I game directed the concept phase of Harry Potter Hogwarts mystery, which was the first ever free to play Harry Potter game. And the first time JK Rowling actually let someone, uh, create lore for the Harry Potter universe that wasn't written directly from her, um, you know, her, her pen. And, um, I, it's actually where I met my my co-founder at Strider, um, uh, one of one of the co-founders at Strider, Mike Brosman, because while I was the, the game director on the concept phase and did kind of like the, you know, the, the the paper prototypes and art direction and you know getting everything settled with Warner Brothers and, and everyone, he actually like really built the game, um, and you know um, that game did is done like half a billion in revenue and six years later still, um, you know like a top 150 top grossing title, which is, which is amazing and a testament to the live operations um, being run by, by Jam City, um, but had a really, really solid base. Uh, I left, um, you know, the studio was sold to Netmarble, Netmarble Jam City. Um, I left after Potter shipped um, and I, that's when I fell down the crypto kind of rabbit hole, um, really just 
speculating and losing like tons of money. Um, and, and then that being the impetus for me to like really have to like do a lot more. It's like <laughs> the best impetus for research is like when you're just like losing money hand over fist. Um, and, um, <laughs> Uh, I got I got most of it back though, which is good. Um, and then you know, Crypto Kitties happen, and uh, I was thinking about building in the space, but um, you know, like I come more from like the use the kind of gameplay and usability side, um, not necessarily just like tinkering with like the the, the base layers of technology. Um, so I waited. I did. I worked on a HTML5 games engine called Knock Knock. Um, and eventually ended up at Andreessen Horowitz helping start the games network and games investment, um, you know, supporting the games investment practice, um, among some other stuff. I was there for two years, then did some M and A, um, uh, things and, and just wanted to get back to building. And I was like, what should I do? Um, and I was already like, you know, kind of again, po I'm poorly buying NFTs, uh, and, um, attempting to understand like the value mechanics as a speculator, but I'm a, a, a poor investor. That is not what I am good at. Uh, I am, a, a, you know, so, but, but what was interesting is again, as I'm losing money and, or, you know, whatever, I'm doing a bunch of research and I'm seeing what's happening and like, there's tons of communities popping up at this point. And you've got some incredible like traction from things already, like forgotten runes and parallel, obviously apes, um, you know, obviously Axie was exploding at the time. It was even before it like started to really explode. Um, and, you know, I was just looking at it and being like, this is incredible. Like this is everything I've ever wanted in, uh, in the world, which is like democratized kind of IP creation or a means for real, like collaborative community driven, um, you know, storytelling and finance. Um, you know, like, uh, and, and, and participation and ownership. Uh, but <clears throat> as a, as a game developer, you just constantly see holes in everything. Um, and we saw just some massive, massive holes. Uh, and I started talking to Mike Brosman about it, who was getting hit up by like crypto companies to join them as like their chief product officer. So he was like getting, you know, deeper and deeper into it as well. And we were just kind of like, man, like there's no like repeatable engagement layer. Um, for PFP communities, for Web3 games that are shipping very traditionally in terms of like the way that they're going to market and the way that they're building their game, they're abstracting the assets and they're financializing the assets, but they're not building differently so that they still have these, these large time um, gaps where once a drop is done, the, the community is like, okay, live operations has started, but there's no game. There's no like engagement layer. And the other thing that we were noticing is traditional media trying to get into the space. And also they, they and traditional gaming have had a legacy of not really being able to, for, for a variety of reasons, engage community creators um, as well and leaving a ton of value on the table and then being stuck in like licensing and co-development um, means to get into market. Um, and so we were like, wow, like we've built like these like really elegant, you know, fiction based uh, game loops that are very casual, but very, get very, very deep over time. And we, we were like, well, like there's no onboarding for web three in general. There's no orientation for communities in general. This ownership model is not working the games, traditional media and PFP communities all need either a secondary or primary means of actually creating this contribution. There aren't good reward loops. Everyone's focused on kind of like how to build a quote unquote metaverse. Um, but the way that they're thinking about that versus a game we thought was really like incorrect or, or, or not the best strategy. And so we started talking to as many folks as we could and started building this platform and then signed on a bunch of, of, you know, really awesome partners as POCs to really dive in and start building. And we raised uh, some money, um, you know, to, to, to start that journey. And we've been on that journey now for seven months. Is this collaborative community involved IP creation focused on gaming only, or is it more broad? It's the entire entertainment industry. So, you know, in, in all honesty, since I'm not the biggest um, sports person, 
uh, I can't put that sports sports fan. <laughs> uh, like me neither. Yeah, so. yeah. So, so I think that there's very clear and like huge use cases for what we're building in PFP communities in Web three games in traditional games, traditional film and television and music. I believe sports also can be there because sports is a another type of very deep narrative. But I don't know if the narrative translates the way that all of those other segments in global entertainment and media um, translate. And so if I understand you correctly, you are offering developers of whatever type of media a means to tap into the, you know, yet untapped potential of their communities and the creativeness that lies there? Correct. Um, it's all, it also just acts as a perpetual higher engagement community management like function because you're actually creating like dialogue and engagement that has a behavior loop in it versus just kind of leveraging kind of one to many communication tools from web two. Could you walk me through first from the uh, perspective of a developer, what this looks like, like what the, what, how this works. And then also I, I'd be interested to have the same story, but from the bottom up, from the, from the community up. Yep. Yep. What, what's really interesting is it's actually quite, the same the, from a use case perspective, but we'll talk about how it actually differs uh, for like a, a bottoms up versus a, a kind of existing IP or existing team. But essentially we have a tool set that's automated um, and um, templatized. And what the team gets to do is leverage a bunch of different modules, whether they're contribution oriented modules or voting modules or proposal modules, you know, some of which exists in DAOs like today, very like, you know, in very, um, you know, simple ways where it's just like treasury, you know, there's, there's NFT drops, there's a treasury being developed, there's proposals on how to leverage that treasury. And then there's voting on that. And then the transfer of funds from the treasury management solution, and then people leveraging that to build. Right. But, that the way that governance is working currently, uh, the way that um, community can get oriented to work and that the people that are have higher power in the governance uh, via like maybe the amount of tokens they have, the relationship between them isn't informed. Um, so there's no way to orient together and build a culture together around that work easily. Some, some DAOs are doing a re really great job of that, of course, some, but, 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 but most aren't, right? Um, and so the, 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 the solution we have is that we create a behavior loop around, um, engagement by, uh, we have a, what we call a content, a content module system. Uh, and the content system is essentially built from our experience in interactive fiction development. And it allows the vision holder governance to take aspects of their IP um, and to drop it as um, a flow of kind of interactive fiction. But instead of this interactive fiction just being a game, um, users play through it. Um, and at certain points, they come to junctions where they're immersed in the story. And the story is what prompts them for work. Uh, so it's very different when you as a community leader are on a discord or on Twitter or, or wherever you are and you shout into the ether, come do this with us, come contribute for us, come help us with this thing. And, and the audience, half of them don't hear it. Most more than half, like, 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 like 92% don't hear it. Right. Uh, and then the 8% that do hear it are like, wait, are you talking to me? And then, and then, and then like, then there's some percentage of them that's like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see myself as a writer. Um, like, do you want me to write? And then there's like a very small percentage. It's like, all right, I'm going to write. So there's like this, like, you know, and you end up with like 20 people and then they might submit something. Right. And like, you, there might be like a discord channel and everyone's talking about it. Right. But eventually no one comes back. You have to do that whole thing again, that whole like leaky thing again, but with what we're doing is we're orienting you and giving you rewards in that community for every little contribution that you make, even just playing, right? Voting on something, having, uh, and, and 
What, what, and there's a bunch of different types of work you can do. You can incentivize a variety of different behaviors, but it's just done through a game interface. Um, the other part that is uh, really interesting about what we're doing is that as you gain reputation um, and as you do a variety of things on the platform, we're creating a really rich data set. Um, and that data set is segmenting the community into a variety of personas, whether it's skilled workers, whether it's passive contributors, whether it's active contributors, whether it's passive fans, whether it's speculators, so that and that the activity and the 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 um, er, the the uh, recency of that activity is very important. Recency is very important in community management. What is happening today? Who is engaged today? And like who is engaged more passively, right? So that you as a community lead now have a bunch of data and the ability to reach directly out into a person's feed of work or activity that they can do. So. It's just like a game. I come, I know what quests I have to do. I know the rewards I'm getting for them. And I'm giving you feedback that allows you to customize and segment my experience. Except it's all about managing the community and building something together. And that's what Strider is essentially. So if I'm a game creator, I can take an aspect of my IP while I'm in development. And it's a form of building excitement, but it's more active. Um, and it also gives me people like the, it gives me insight into who from the community I should like be spending more time with and like actually deepening my relationship with, right? Because you could spend the same six hours talking to a mass of community members without any idea of the value. You could take that same six hours, speak to a much smaller portion of the community that you know is going to act in a certain way and get way more out of it. And um, that, uh, and that, and as you do that consistently, as you gain kind of this side treasury um, of funds, you can have more IP building, um, you know, uh, uh, pro derivative products, whether it's like, let's also add a podcast, let's add a novella, let's do a comic book, let's do some linear content. All the stuff that, that game teams and other teams don't really want to fund as part of their game development process. And that would seem really disruptive from the core flow. But if you're creating this separate workforce and your community team is the one managing this, this is a, a better use of their time, essentially, that's creating way more value. And it is the new, a new and best form of community management. There's, it's just such a better value proposition for everybody. So I actually completely recognize the problem that you're solving. So I'm, I've recently, a few months ago, started the DAO. We currently have about 200 members. And uh, part of what we want to do is also start writing some yep. content. And so it's like, oh, we want to write about this, you know, or like who's interested in these types of topics to write about? And then people vote. So it's like, oh, I'm interested in, in learning about this. And then you're looking for people to actually yep. write shit, you know? And then, and then it's great. Oh, totally. You know? Oh, totally. Because uh, no yeah. one knows how to get started doing that. But if you put it to them in a way that is much more like engaged, like, you know, I, this is going to be weird, but right. If I said to you, Nico, um, I really, I'd love for you to write a, a, a like one pager about a character uh, and the character lives in this dark forest and he's, a, you know, she, or he's a recluse. Right. And, um, you know, yeah, I'd love for you to write a page on that. You're just kind of like, uh, so I'm just going to like write a page of like, but if I said, Hey, Nico, me and you are walking through a dark forest. The wind is blowing and rustling in the trees. We hear something in the distance and see it. you hold up your lantern and someone emerges from the bushes. What do they look like? It's, it's kind of much easier for your brain to kind of immediately go right because mm -hmm. you're already there right with this character and all of a sudden your brain it's just the way the human brain works it just starts activating yes. to fill in the holes because that's what the brain does it tries to fill in holes but if i give you parameters that are open and ask you to figure out all the parameters of what i'm looking for and then write it and get over your own like fears or like resistance, inherent creative, or any type of resistance that a person has 
to get started in doing something with very little guidance and handholding, it's a really scary proposition. But if it's done in play, mm -hmm. if it's done via the storytelling and narrative mechanics the human brain loves, because it loves to fill in context holes, you're like moving much faster. That's fascinating. Do you see, and this is absolutely to the, uh, aside from, from the conversation, but do you see applications of this outside of more like just pure creative creativity? Yeah. You know, I mean, in all honesty, like I, I, I think there is, right. Like I think that there definitely is like, I think in software development um, in general or in other forms of product development or other types of contri you know, contributory, like um, I mean, you could go as far as saying governance in, it, in itself, right, could be updated um, and how like people are brought into those processes. Because again, I think we've, we've always been a, you know, a one to many. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go, go, go on a rant here about web two, but I was part of, I'm old enough to have been a part of the full cycle of, of web one and web one, while it was, you know, like read, read, write, you know, like it was, it was weird. Like when I say weird, like people got weird with it. They created like weird <laughs> communities that were really like had a lot of flavor and heart and like a lot of like depth. And it, they feel like DAOs kind of feel in web three and what web two, like really did a bit of a, it did some great things, right? It gave everyone like essentially broadcast capacity at scale. Um, and created like insane commerce benefits. Um, but it also has a ton of downsides. One was homo one is homogenization. Two is like platform homogenization. So like the amount of creativity any one community could like imbue into its space was limited. Two, um, the bifurcation of brands from their audiences and, and making it that a paid relationship in order to access those audiences. Um, And, um, and three, uh, obviously is mis misinformation and more opinion based conversation, right? Where anyone can have an opinion. Um, but what, 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 you know, so, 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 so with web three, I think you're kind of getting the best of web one and the best of web two in that, uh, from, from in the, in the, in the dynamic we're talking about in communities, because you get an extraordinarily deep level of customization, uh, an extraordinarily like deep level of organization that's possible. Right. And, uh, you know, and then, and you get, and then you get, so you get all the weirdness and you get all the, the, the you know, there's no centralization, there's no barrier. Um, and then, um, you get, uh, the ability to, uh, share and own in kind of the, the ownership facilities of, of the internet, uh, I mean, of, of what you're building and, The most important one I've forgotten. I literally just had it and I forgot it and now I cannot remember it. Um, but it was, it's, it, it was really good. Uh, let's just say that it was, it was a really good one and now I've forgotten it for some reason. But that's an, in, in and of itself, that's already enough. It's like, is like now you have direct to consumer relationships that you can orient and you can build with and they can be as weird and differentiated as possible. So no one is being, uh, kind of drowned out by an algorithm. I'm curious to understand how hands-on the um, parameter setting or the, because in the end, you know, in the example you gave of, you know, you have a dark forest, someone lives there in one, and like on one end, you, you say like, okay, these are like three parameters that you have and that's all, you know, go, go ahead. And the other, and the other one, there's more like handholding and, and walking someone through. I'm curious, you just mentioned algorithms. Is there any automation there or is there a lot of like manual work involved for the, the vision? Yeah, so Uh, that's a great question. Um, so there's no, um, kind of automation on the, um, on the, like, there's no like AI automation on the content creation side, like something that like, um, you know, the folks at like AI dungeon, um, and lat latitude are doing it's, but we are going to be leveraging a like, likely leveraging AI, uh, art generation as part of the pro uh, as part of the submission process, because that still is a creativity driven, a human, creativity driven process. It just leverages technology, but, but the automation for us comes from the, what, what, you know, folks that have built game systems, extensible game systems understand well is we tune, we tune a bunch of templates, right? Like we tune a ton of templates so that all of those templates are tuned, right? When you have templates that are tuned 
for the right session length, the right, you know, um, retention, the right kind of moments for where work prompts are associated, how rewards are given, what the actual, like, you know, immediacy of feedback feels like at different points, um, how the communication and orientation works. When you've done all that work and you've done that work over and over again, like the same way that like, um, it sounds like a weird example, but like uh, Candy Crush, right? Like they created a engagement mechanism, which just happens to be a match three. And then they know now that like, if they tune this match three appropriately, that it like creates just insane ongoing retention and engagement. And now all they have to do is drop in new puzzle designs, le leveraging that exact same tunable system over and over again. So the work then becomes what is the puzzle? Like what, it, like what is the base puzzle? In ours is we have template, 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 template. And then the work that needs to be done is there needs to be a writer or two, an artist or two. And they use all those templates and just, it's like, it's like paint by colors. You just put the content in where you're told to do it. And everything else on the back end of our system essentially allows you to either customize that using system content and tools, or you can customize it more you want, right? So that there's like a base level of work, but if you want to make it super customized and get really crazy with it, you, you can do that add your own sounds, add your own effects, add your own, like whatever. But we have the, the our platform takes care of all of the kind of the, 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 the automation that, that really matters. And then it's just putting in the content. So I like to put bold visions of potential applications of web three out yep. there as much as the next guy. Right. And one of the questions that irritate me <laughs> endlessly is, you know, but why do you need the blockchain for this? <laughs> yeah. And so now I'm going to be, I'm going to yep. be that guy, right? Yep. Sorry, Andrew. It's, everything you described feels like it would be possible on a centralized platform. Where is the, the big unlock? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, uh, a great question. Uh, and, and, um, and, and it's simple. Uh, that's actually the best part is it's simple. Is essentially like all of this contribute, contribute contribution data, right? All the data that we just talked about that like is basically segmentation contribution data, um, and um, the rewards as well, like all of the rewards. Um, all of that is essentially like a giant composable data set and an and, and open data set, essentially, right? How open we make that is really based on like the user's desire, right, uh, for, for, for openness. But for instance, like there's a network that exists under X game, right? Like, and there's an, a network that exists under Y game. And let's say there was a system, let's say, let's, let's say we're in the future and our, our platform is a giant hit. We have a huge network and system, you know, the, the, the contributors and the, the skilled workers and the speculators and the fans over at IPA, right? And the speculators and the fans and the people over at IPB, right? They are adding value to those communities. Now, as a community owner, I want to talk to people from community B that are the best, and I want them to come over to my community, right? And the it's a way to have the user own their data set, allow someone to access it, and have a conversation about value exchange, about how, oh, what can I go do over at your community? Oh, how am I going to get rewarded over there, right? So that open data set, like one, like that crosses all, across all, like every IP basically shares that data set, all users share that data set. So now these data sets are not walled off, right? Uh, from, from, from each other, which they usually are. Would it, yeah. Would it be fair to characterize this? And I've, I've heard this term a lot and it makes me cringe a bit, but as a IP focused LinkedIn or decentralized so, LinkedIn? So, 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 so. That's what's really interesting in, 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 it's not, I don't look, I don't look at it that way, right? I look at it as, as an IP based, like as a, as a community, as, as a network of, of people building IPs with brand owners or from the ground up together, right? The natural thing that happens when you have an open data set like this is that it's essentially becomes a, cause like a protocol without data and context is useless, right? So it's like, but if you, have a use case that generates a significant amount of data and empowers a user to leverage that data, it now can be a protocol for communication and for 
um, value exchange. Additionally, how people accrue value as an IP owner, like me as a contributor, how I own a piece of the IP or I get a royalty from every, from, if I make a contribution on Strider system, I should have said this earlier, I can, I get a share of that IP, which is a huge, the huge ownership aspect, right? Huge. And um, I also can, can, can do other skilled work or other rewarded work that can get me a variety of types of rewards that accrue. That's not just pro rata revenue share in the DAO, right? Now, that's another really amazing effect of blockchain is now as a platform and as an IP holder, I don't need to do a bunch of reconciliation of revenue via my IP. The All of the contract data just knows who should get what, and it all happens automatically, and it all happens immediately and persistently. So it's like the, the management of that data set, the management of the database, the ownership of that data, right? It's now with the user and it's with the network. It's not with any central entity, right? And it's really controlled only by the network using it and leveraging it together in a value exchange. Um, and that's why blockchain is so important in what we're doing is because it allows the creation of that powerful network. It makes it run more efficiently and it makes it so there's no central data governor, governor in that situation uh, dictating who gets access to what data. That's really cool. Is it? But it, so I've been working on, you know, I think a lot of content platforms will become tokenized where everyone that cons like adds value to that platform receive a platform native token or currency. And then everyone who wants to consume would have to like pay in that, in the same currency. Um, and it's, so it becomes its own like tokenized yeah. ecosystem. What you're building, will that result in like tokenized IP where everyone who actually, you know, adds value to that IP will receive like ownership, partial ownership of that IP. And as the IP grows and generates revenues, they, they would like get a, an so, equal share of that. Yeah. Yeah. Like so, that? so it actually is up to each of the, you know, community owners, right? Like, um, you know, for instance, um, you know, we uh, are working with, with a really awesome, um, you know, traditional media company. And, um, like if you think about it, right, they can build like through their initial like community and, and all of their initial IP, like they can build and then become a facilitator in web three for tons of other entertainment properties, right? Because they actually will have a platform to do that, right? Like um, as they build their community, we can focus on a variety of different segments and essentially allow um, all of these users um, to, to like, there's basically like a, a few stages. One is like going um, to, to, you know, game, like games that need these communities and, and or PFP communities. Um, and, um, essentially, um, the users can, uh, gain a share of the pro rata revenue, um, or IP ownership based on what the, the community decides to provide. So some community, like they have, they have a, a bunch of variables, uh, both on the, um, on the royalty side or IP ownership side and on any type of token token issuance, if there's not an existing token already in their ecosystem. So um, for instance, I can make a community in which the vision holder governance gets the majority of the IP ownership um, and, you know, or like the production team, quote unquote, or like the, the, the big wigs. I can make it feel more centralized, right? I can make a community where most of it goes to contributors, right? Where like the majority of it goes to, because really you've got, you've got four variables here. You've got the treasury, you've got the vision holders and or IP owners, right? You've got the contributors and then you've got Strider, the platform, right? Strider, the platform, we're obviously going to try to create some standardization around what, what our, you know, small piece of the pie is, right? But then you've got these three variables. Mm -hmm. How much should go to the treasury? How much should go centrally to the people that are really own and operate this? And how much should go to the con contributors? Those three variables should be as flexible to what type of community people want to create. 
but ultimately, yes, the da- like the contributors who, and and the, the the fans that are accruing value in this IP, as this IP grows, their share of that revenue is growing. The difference, though, is is there's no individual asset that is fractionalizing. There's no like IP that is an NFT or an IP that is a you know because that would that would fall under like securities issues, um, and so. You know, mm-hmm. an IP doesn't work that way in the real world also, by the way. You know what I mean? There's no like, there's no like thing that is Star Wars, right? Like Star Wars is mm-hmm. a ton of thing, a ton of, you know, like canon, a ton of products, a ton of merchandise and a ton of goodwill, right? It's like, it's like an, in, there's an intangible element to what, and, and, and the only yeah. time that you know how much an IP is worth is when a buyer actually like consolidates all of that value into a bid. Uh, so so it's intangible until it becomes tangible. There's no actual asset. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really fascinating. So as some of our listeners will know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the, the concept of, of loot, where you, know, you put something out there for yep. the community to build on. Um, what I've seen there and what I've learned there it, is that it, yep. it is hard leaving things up for the community. And, um, you know, my question to you now is, do you have some examples, maybe even, even from the Web2 world, or maybe already something that Strider has accomplished as proof points for, you know, when you, like, these are the amazing things that IP creation, like decentralized to the community can can uh, um, result in? There's a lot. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of, um, of, of good examples. Um, I think that, the um you know the best ones kind of come out of the you know communal storytelling of you know it's 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 very basic obviously but like and it's obviously not at scale but you know tabletop role playing games is like where communal storytelling you know kind of grows from and then you you have people that have already built mm-hmm. brands uh, for broadcasting right that that content, that communal storytelling and communal content creation, um, uh, you know, um, activity. Additionally, there's, I always forget the, I, I, I used to check this thing out um, a while ago. It's basically an archive of like, of an archive of, of, of artifacts about like a government conspiracy um, that people just are contributing more and more artifacts to. And it's turned into this giant database of artifacts that people have just gone through the process of connecting into now what feels like a real tangible thing. Um, I think there's a ton of other ones that are weirder, but I would say everything from like, there's certain types of memes, right? And the lore that's come out of a meme is like, amazingly rich um, and sometimes communally led. Um, you know, there's all that kind of creepy pasta um, and other kind of stories on Reddit um, and Slender Man. And those have been licensed by Hollywood to like turn into IPs, right? Those I'd say like, aren't the best example of like communal storytelling and or c- communal contribution as much as just like independent community built IP that like becomes real because all IP essentially is available for more building on top of it. Um, Wattpad, ARGs from the Web1 era, um, you know, all the UGC and modding platforms that are coming uh, out and or have been created, they just are doing it in a very different way than what we're talking about because it's more about tool sets and composition for like, assets more than it is about like the systems, the assets live in and the lore that, that govern those, those worlds. Um, gotcha, Andrew. And um, now to my final question, and it's one of the favorite ones that I've, uh, or my new favorite one that I like to ask on pitch meetings. And that is, so in five years from now, imagine it's 2027 and Strider Dow has failed. What happened? Um, uh, it, yeah, that is a great question. Um, I would say that um, Strider failed because we d- 
didn't actually find the right balance of user agency and like the ability for the community managers to really engage and create relationships with those folks, mainly because the reward structure either wasn't correct or the personas, the amount of different personas that we have, like there's an imbalance in like the kind of, you know, the, the market, like the dynamics of a community, like um, there aren't enough, you know, like strong contributor types or skill worker types versus, um, you know, fa people, people may, may, maybe want to, don't want to engage as much as we, we, we believe they want to engage. Um, uh, that, that, that really at the end of the day, community is a passive thing and that, that, you know, mostly communities like think they want to engage more, but they don't really want to like a small or only a very small portion do or our, our reward set is wrong or, you know, the platform itself isn't easy to use. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of different ways it could, it could, yeah. you know, not work out. I often get the answer that it's it's the market or like the world is not yet ready for this. Um, so I like that you you say that there's some things that you could do wrong in the future that might result to you you and, and Strider failing. So uh, it's a good answer. I like it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, I try to. I mean, that's you know, I mean, if you can't be honest about about like what the problems are going to be with product development, then you know you're 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 going to have a harder time looking them in the face later when they show up. Yeah. So. It's just something, you know, something you you just have to get used to. Mm hundred -hmm. percent. Good. All right. Um, Andrew, this was fantastic. I'm, I'm fascinated. I feel like, um, some of my friends in the loot ecosystem could probably use Strider. So, um, maybe I can set mm -hmm. something up there. Um, in any case, thank you so much for joining. Uh, this was a real pleasure. Um, and, um, where can, where can people find you to learn more, um, about you and, and Strider? Yeah. So I'm on Twitter at farming underscore. Uh, XP, okay, um, and at Strider XYZ, uh, and you can access all of our social channel cha channels there. And uh, you know, Strider on Twitter is Strider underscore DAP as well. Fantastic, good. Well, this was great, uh, listener. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Um, I really like this. So people know that you know, I like the weird stuff. Like the, the, the things that you wouldn't immediately <laughs> think about if you think about blockchain and games. Um, and yep. this falls firmly into that category. So, um, yeah, <laughs> props to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Nico. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. So, uh, listener, I hope you enjoyed as well. Um, if you did, feel free to give us a, a thumbs up, a like, and a subscribe. And, uh, yeah, this was the Metacost, and we look forward to speaking to you in the next episode. Ciao.